Romans 2, 6 to 11. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Be seated. Now let's pray. Lord, we're thankful to gather this morning under this, the word that you have given us. Pray you would speak uh, to all of us from what is here. I think it's a strong word. I think it uh, has much to teach us and maybe challenge us and maybe even comfort us. Now, as we begin, guide us all in all truth. In Christ's name, amen. Well, we, we returned to this chapter, and we had uh, that break for, for Easter, and before that I had the break where, where Ross, you know, was able to preach for me, and I know you were all encouraged by that, and as I prepare from week to week in these passages, you know, I, I tell you that sometimes we have to go deep because the pearls are at the bottom, and as I was digging, so to say, in this particular text, I felt like, like I was starting to hit oil. And so I, I, we just kept going, I just kept going down. And so this is another one of those weeks where I think this treatment of the text properly done is going to require a couple of weeks. And so we're going to dig for oil. We're going to keep digging. And, and that's what we're going to do. So by way of just reminder, let's, let's talk about chapter one. Chapter one was, was Paul's introduction of his, of his authorship, of his work, of his person, of his goal, of his call to ride of his of his pride for that young church in this pagan city uh he, he wanted to see them so badly he had a, a high affection for them but you know and we knew from the text that he was prohibited from so but he still intends to go and he will ultimately get there not the way he wants to but he will get there and we talked about in that chapter of the fact that the unbelieving world the the gentiles have had every chance to respond to the things of God through nature. The God has made himself clearly known from everything that is manifestly visible, touchable, realizable. But that man has rejected that. The natural man has rejected what God has done naturally. And so that we saw they have inverted the order of worshiping the creator versus worshiping the created thing. And we saw that God was going to give them over. So that was kind of chapter one. And we were dealing with that person. But this morning, as we deal with, with chapter two, we're, we're changing hands to not looking at the Gentile person. We're looking at the, the Jewish person. Or maybe you want to even use the term the believer. Or maybe we're looking at the person who maybe better is the moralist. The person who thinks that he or she is, is right in and, of, in and of himself. And this is this emphasis that continues into chapter two that we saw in chapter one. But we're dealing with a different person. So it's the same vein but with a different audience. So here's the question. And you have to answer this. Where am I truly going? Like, where am I truly going? And what path am I taking to get there? Where am I truly going? And what path am I taking to get there? You're going to answer that question now, or you already are in your mind, but maybe at the end of the sermon, you're going to be challenged to answer where it is that you are going and you might be challenging your answer because you're going to question the path. Well, today's text is going to break down into three major headings. And my sermon title this morning is The Destination Chosen. No, this is not a sermon on predestination. For any of you who, who are excited about that or, or, or are upset about it, it's not that. That's coming, but it's not this morning. The Destination Chosen. And so we're going to break down this text this morning in three headings. And maybe you want to write these down in your margin or in your notes because you like to take notes, which we encourage here. We're going to see the text break down into these ideas, and we're going to see the very first thing being the purpose of God. The purpose of God. These are going to be alliterations, which, which help us to, to remember things and to grow and, and, and to challenge our minds. So these are all going to be alliterations. Number one, the purpose of God. The second going to, thing we're going to see in the subdivision breakdown is going to be the pursuit of the godly. 
So we have the purpose of God, then we have the pursuit of the godly. That's, a, that's the second division in this morning's text. And then the, the third breakdown is going to be the pushback of the godless. The pushback of the godless. These are the three headings that are going to frame your, your baskets to place your thoughts. Now, this text, as we see it, is in a, in a, in a feature or in a design called a chiasm. And a chiasm is, is the way the, a lot of scripture is written and other work where we have a, a thought and another thought and then another thought and then a thought and then a return to the earlier thought and then a return to the original thought. So you can think of it as A, B, C, C, B, A. It is, and this is meaningful because this, you're going to have to follow this as I, as I preach because what we have is verse 6 and 11 are joined together, okay? Verse 6 and 11 are together. Verse 7 and 10 are together, and verse 8 and 9 are together. And I say that to you because that's how Paul has written this opening here that we're, that we're spending time on, and that's how I have come up with those three subdivisions for you. So let's just jump right in here. And I want to ask you another question. And some of you who know me, which is all you can do probably to come to church every day, but you do. How many of you like to travel? I know some of you travel a lot. I don't like it. <laughs> like, I, I don't like it. I, I don't know how else to say it. I don't like it. I don't want to. I don't want to go on vacation. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to. I'm not good at it. But the reality is, is when I'm forced to go somewhere and I have to travel to get there, you know, I know where we're going. I, I, even though I don't want to, I know we have to get there. And so my wife knows that the first two days of any trip, I'm just a curmudgeon. I'm grumpy. I'm, I'm just not happy. She just, and she has to know either I leave him home, which she does many times, or she knows that the first you know, a few days are just going to be no fun. But that's me. But in every case, though, I know where I'm going. We know where we're going. And you, when you travel, typically you have a destination in mind, do you not? You know, our, our plan is we're, we're, we're going to do the North Rim. Our plan is, we're, you know, we're going to work our way to the historical sites on the East Coast. Our plan is, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see the islands in the Caribbean. You have a destination, and, and, and that's where you are planning to get, and that's where you want to go, and that's important. So when you do travel, you have an idea in mind of where you want to go. You have an idea on what path you need to travel to get there. In other words, you must be intentional to get where you intend to travel. And what we are doing, and this is a, a good plug for the men's group, which meets on the third Friday of every single month, men's campfire, we have a theme for the year. And we have two rules that are dominating every meeting that we have, and that is rule number one. Everybody ends up somewhere, few get there on purpose. That's rule number one. Everybody ends up somewhere, but few people get there on purpose. And the second rule is, I am where I am because I chose to be here. In other words, whatever situation is in your life where you've gotten, that's because you've chosen it. You've, you've just chosen it. Whatever you've chosen, that's where you are. So where do you want to go? You need to travel to get there. How many of you want to go to heaven? Then you must be on the path to get there. You must be on the path to get there. In other words, you will not get there on accident. You will not get there by chance. You will not arrive there willy Nilly. You know him? <laughs> no, you must get there on purpose. You must get there on purpose. So let's look at verse 6 and 11. Let me read it again. He will render to each one according to his works. So what we're dealing with here first, remember, is the purpose of God. This is the purpose of God, verse 6, along with verse 11. Let me jump all the way. I'm going to read them both again. He will render to each one according to his works. Jump all the way to 11. For God shows no partiality. We, we start with God, we end with God in this text. Now, look at those. These are dealing with God's character. These are dealing with 
God's decree. This is dealing with God's purpose. This is dealing with God's person. This is dealing with God's plan for humanity. This is the, 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 the reality that we see in the text. Now, the reason I think that verse 6 and verse 7 and this whole bulk of the text needs another, another week of treatment is because there is a teaching and there is a doctrine that is in wide circulation that has been around for quite a long time that is glossed over by many people in evangelical circles. And this particular doctrine, <clears throat> excuse me, says and sounds something akin to this. A Christian is saved by grace and that is wonderful. And works contribute nothing to salvation and works have absolutely nothing to do with my walk. Now that all sounds pretty good, except that it, it, it's, it's going to need to be fleshed out a little bit and there could be some want in that doctrine. This is essentially the tenor of this assumed doctrine with the intent of protecting salvation from, from anything that has to be added to it. So we, we get that. We concede this, this reality that there's nothing that adds to make salvation possible. So we don't want to overemphasize works, in other words. We never want to do that. After all, does not Paul and elsewhere talk about salvation is by faith alone? It's in grace alone. It's found in Christ alone. It's revealed in the scriptures alone and this all to the glory of God alone. Yes, of course. But what Paul is saying in verse 6 and 11 and, and in else other texts which we're going to see, Paul is saying that the eternal God, the eternal creator God of the entire cosmos, this God, that God is going to render, render to each person, not just to one person, but to each person according to his works. To each person, that's all of us, that's all people, every person is going to get rendered from God according to the work he or she has done. Now we're going to come to this more, and we're going to look at this more depth later, but suffice us now, let's just think about this. This idea of, of render, some verses will say judge, some will say, again, render. Some will say, repay. Some will say, reward. And the sense of this word in the Greek is apodidomai. And apodidomai carries with it the idea of the right do according to the input. The, the, what's, what's absolutely fair and required. In other words, again, it's rendered. It's, it's what, is, what is the wages that are, are requisite for the input? It's, it's, in other words, it's rightness. This is the kind of the idea of apodidomite, to give what is owed, the right due for acts and services. In other words, if you invite me over to your house and say, hey, Paul, will you paint a room? I'm going to say no. <laughs> but if you ask me to paint a room, for example, and I did come to paint your room, and it took me eight hours to paint your room, and you gave me the prevailing wage to painting your room, you, gave, you rendered to me what was due. That's fair. That's what the text is saying. God is going to do what's fair based on what everybody has done. This is the co compensation that's going to come our way. Like the scripture elsewhere says, the wages of sin is what? Okay, there's, there's nothing else that comes. That's what it is. Well, that's rendering. That's only the right due for what has been brought forth. Notice it is not just to the Gentile person. Notice it's not just to the Jew or moralist that God's going to render, but also to the Gentile person. And there's to everybody. I know what, why this is coming because it looks like I'm dying up here. I'm really not, but thank you, Kimmy. But what also there is here is the sense of not only will God render, he's going to also render either in the full sense to all those who have surrender their life to Jesus, that person will also get his or her due, as well as the person who rejected everything that God has ever done, that person will also get his due. In other words, works do matter. They do participate. Not for salvation, but because of salvation. Now that's a distinction there again that we're going to see. Again, these last words, according to his works, this is all reinforcing of what our text is telling us. This word for, for according to his works the word in Greeks for, the word in Greek rather for works is ergon. 
And if you think of the, the prefix there is erg, and if you think of the word erg, and you can imagine our uh, Eng anglicized or our English word for energy is erg. So in other words, God is going to render to us how we have brought forth energy, what we have done, what we have said, what we have brought forth. This is, the, this is what the text is telling you. So, no, so with this, we're seeing the purpose of God. Verse 6 says that God is going to do this. Verse 11 says that God will also show no partiality. Isn't that a good thing? I, I'm very thankful that God is, is, is impartial. Because I know that like you and like I can be, I, I can be partial. I can be biased. Well, God is going to do so impartial. Look at Psalm 62. In the Old, in the Old Testament, in Psalm 62, you can see this idea of, of this nature of how God does what he does. And that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. Look also ahead in Proverbs. In Proverbs 24, 12, you also see this idea consisting of this. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And he will, and will he not repay man according to his works? And then do you want to even jump a little bit farther ahead? You can see in, in Job 34, 11, was for according to the work of man, he will repay. And according to his ways, he will make it befall. See, God cannot not be fair. Let me say that again. God cannot not be fair. God's character demands and can only be that he is fair. But we like to think that we're fair. We like to think that we're impartial. I raised my two daughters and they survived. I don't know how, but, but they did. And some of your kids survived too, right? To the, by the glory of the Lord. And you know, as, as I think about my kids and sometimes I have to treat them differently and we do treat our kids differently, right? Fair for your children is what each one needs. My youngest daughter, if she just knew daddy was mad, she would cry. My oldest one would be like, you think that spank hurts? <laughs> that doesn't hurt me. That doesn't hurt. Spank me again. My kids were different. And so, it, so I was partial. I was unfair in that, in that regard. But I can state without equivocation that we are not wholly fair in what we do. We're not. We are impartial. And no matter how hard you try, because our sin affects us. Our sin changes us. Our sin is influencing everything we do. And you're not going to get rid of sin until you die. We're going to deal with it, all of us. But God, this is not God's limitation like it is for, for me and for you. Charles Simeon wrote here a little bit long, and I, I want to just read it because how we can find others, you know, to be wrong because we're not necessarily fair. Listen to what he says, quote, because he says to people, we always find others worse than ourselves. Here's what he says. If this disposition manifests itself amongst equals, much more does it among those who are placed at some distance from each other. Whether the difference be in age or rank, relation or general habits and dispositions. But then listen. The old condemn the follies of the young. And the young, the severity of the old. The rich inveigh against the idleness or dishonesty of the poor. The poor against the selfishness and oppressiveness of the rich. Parents complain of their children, children of their parents, masters of their servants, and servants of their masters. In like manner, the bigot and the free thinker, the prodigal and the penurious, the hermit and the gay, all love to indulge in mutual criminations, all overlooking their own peculiar failings and condemning without reserve the characteristic failings of others. Does not Jesus tell us quite clearly in the Sermon on the Mount that we must, before we inspect somebody else, that we must remove the plank from our eye so that we can see clearly the speck in our brothers. But what do we do? We have a speck in ours and how quick we are to point out the planks in everybody else's. This is the way of us because of our sin. 
Well, so we see then two items under the purposes of God. So maybe you just want to do these at A and a B. Under the purposes of God, we have, number one, that they are equitable. God's purposes are equitable. And I mean they're fair in the most supreme, cosmic, glorious sense. That's what I mean by equitable. And they are without bias. God is not biased in his equity. God is not biased in his purposes. God is fair. And maybe you want to just label all these with a circle and with an equal sign next to it and use this word. God is just. That's the summation of everything I've just said. God is just. Now, that's verse 6 and 11. So with that established fact that we know that God is just, here's what relates to the question that I asked just a moment ago as we begin to look at our text here. I asked you, what is your destination? Where are you going? I asked you all if you want to go to heaven, and, mo and most of you just, I heard you kind of the room say, I want to go to heaven. I do want to go. Yes, I want to go. Well, now we're going to have a division of the path where there's a heaven-bound path, and there's a not heaven-bound path. And you can supply the word that, that that means. Two paths are going to devise here. Now, verse 7 to 10, as we look at this next section of text here, verse 7 to 10 is not the same person. Verses 7 is one person. And then the next verse is a different person. And there's a distinction between them, much as I have been trying to labor during the entirety of these 20 minutes I've been preaching. There's a distinction here. Look at verse 7, 10. Let me read them. To those, in other words, this is not to all, to those who by patience in well-doing seek, notice Paul's words here, seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. That's what the verse is saying. Let me jump ahead to verse 10. But glory and honor, and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also the Greek. So you can see here that this path, this person is intentionally on, because this path, this person is intentionally on, has this person intentionally doing something. Intentionally seeking, intentionally mindful, intentionally trying. Is this person perfect? No. Paul is not saying that this path is one of perfection. Paul is saying this path is one of persistence. One of continuation. One of not becoming discouraged. One of not quitting. One of what he says. Those who by patience in well-doing seek. Like I want to do good in all times. In my head, in my thoughts, I often don't. I often want to do well in what I touch. I often don't. I oftentimes want to do well in what I say. I often don't. Can anybody relate to me? But that's the direction. So it's not about perfection. It's about direction. What is the overall direction of your life? That's what Paul is getting at here in these words. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. And all those things are possible when we're on the path to heaven. All those things become possible when that is what we are seeking. And that changes us. That changes our affections. It changes and it curves our, 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 our desires. Even though we still see our ugliness come forward at times, it does change us. This person is looking for glory and honor and, and, and it brings forth peace. And we know that whenever we stray from that path, we have a loss of peace, don't we? We have a loss of peace. Well, this idea of glory, honor, and mortality, this is what happens at salvation. The scripture talks in many, 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 many places of glorification. Our responsibilities to, to glorify God, but the reality is that the Christian also has an opportunity for being glorified in the salvific sense, but also in attestation, also in our witness, there are so many ways, and I won't even spend time here on that this morning. Well, it's saying that this person is going to be rendered, notice again, there will be wrath and fury, which we'll get to that in just a minute, but for the other person in verse 7, he will give eternal life. That's what I want. 
That's what every pastor who's preaching the scripture wants to, his people to pursue. It's eternal life. Right? Why do you come to church? Because you want to be on the right path. You want to learn what pleases God. You want to learn where you still have sin that, that sticks closer than a brother. You still know the areas that, 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 that need battle. That's why we come, to be challenged, to be encouraged, to be rebuked, to continue, to be on the right path. Because we have a destination in mind where you're not going to get there on accident. You must get there on purpose. Well, this idea, again, of the follower of Jesus here. The truly, listen to me, the truly converted person is on this path. He or she doesn't give up. She does never quit, no matter the upsets. Because in this life, the scripture says, it is through many tribulations, right, that we must enter the kingdom. That's talking about the Christian life. It's, it's something that's going to be really, really hard. And the season might be very, very, very long. But we persist. We run the race. And if we get knocked down and bruised, we, 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 we pick ourselves up and we start again. Maybe you have a, a terrible failing. You, you repent and you get up and you walk again because it's not about perfection. It's about direction. And that's what Paul is telling you. Are you in that direction, church? You really have to answer. Are you really in that direction? I hope so. Well, I've already talked about verse 7. I already talked about, you know, verse 10 here. If you are the truly converted person, then you are doing these things. You are intending to do these things. You are working towards these things. You are not passive. You are not waiting for it to be automatic you are not hoping it will arrive later. No, you are working for them, towards them, in the direction of them. That's what I mean by the doing. And you know what? The sense really is for, for a lot of us, when you take the whole of the Scripture, for the converted person, we are doing all things unto the Lord. And primarily the things, listen to me, maybe you might not, might not know this, the things that we are to be doing unto the Lord primarily attach themselves to doing them to other people. Doing them within the church. Doing them within your family. Doing them within the sphere of your neighbors. Because listen, God doesn't need your good work. Your neighbor does. God doesn't need my good work. My neighbors do. And all good works. And I see, I, I've, I've encountered so many people who spend so much time doing with every other establishment except the one that is the vessel through which God saves us. And, and that boggles my mind. But we'll leave, it, we'll leave it at that. So we looked at the purpose of God. And now we looked at the purpose of the godly. And this also breaks down into two subheadings. And these two subheadings are these. I call this the pursuit of the godly. This is the unnatural path. This is the unnatural path. Or if you had a street sign on this path, this might be called Blessedness Way. Where do you live? I live on 2205 Blessedness Way. This is the unnatural. Now, why is it unnatural? Because it is not natural for you to do these things unless the Lord quicken you unless the Lord truly converts you, unless you surrender your life to Jesus, this is always going to be unnatural. You will not do this naturally. You will do it for your own pursuit. You will do it for your own glory. You will do it for your own reason. You will not do it for godly reasons. That's what I mean by it's unnatural. This, you don't naturally do this. Conversion produces this. Real conversion produces this. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's involved in their surrender, commitment, trust, reliance, all the, all the things. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation because your old creation won't do this. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Again, nobody is on this path. 
That's what I mean by unnatural, unless you have been converted. Now, again, maybe the answer to you, you need to ask yourself is, have I truly been converted? Have I truly been converted? Then they ask the follow-up question is, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? Oh, Pastor Paul, making friends, right? Making friends. Well, with the pursuit of the godly, we now get into the pushback of the godless the pushback of the godless and this is verse 8 and 9 let me read them but for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness there will be wrath and fury there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil the Jew first, and also the Greek. This is the individual who's the unconverted one. Or this is the individual who is the person who's trusting in himself. This is the person who's patting himself or herself on the back thinking, I'm a pretty swell guy. And I'm a pretty darn good person. I don't need, I don't need God. God is for, for sissies. I do great stuff. I give away my money. I help people. I do good stuff. I support the Humane Society. This is the pushback of the godless. But look at how Paul addresses this one. But, in distinction, again, separate person, to those in verse 7, but for those, we're, we're, we're bifurcating the group of people here into two. There's not three. It's bifurcating, which means two. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury, tribulation, distress for every human being who does evil. And he makes the distinction here for the person who's religious and thinks himself religious, but is not trusting in the Christ of Scripture, as well as for the person who has rejected him. This is the person that is being addressed now. Now this individual... It could be anybody. It could even be some of you sitting in this room who have heard a thousand sermons and today will be one more. It could be any of you here. And you must truly do inventory of your soul and say, am I on the path to heaven? And if you are, what is the darn evidence? Where is the converted life? Where are the signals that would indicate that? Because Paul makes a distinction. They're, 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 they're manifestably able to be discerned. Where are they? What is it? In other words, let me ask you the question differently. If you were to die tonight, if the Lord demanded that your days end tonight, are you 100% certain that you would arrive at heaven? If you can't answer that biblically, you might wonder what path you are on and change your course while you have time. While you have time. Because tonight, if your life is required of you, it's too late. It will be wrath and fury and indignation. This will be the path. Well, James, if you want to go forward a little bit to the book of James, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, James chapter 2, tell us, and I have this on the board for you, James chapter 2, verses 17 to 20 says, um, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is... What's the word? I'm trying to make sure my Bible's the same as yours. (laughs) Well, God in His justness, God in His impartiality will render 
We'll give what is right. We'll give what is due without partiality to how and what you have done with Jesus on how and what you have lived your life on this earth. Was your life inwardly focused or was your life outwardly and Christly focused? Those are two paths. There are only two paths. There's not three, there's not nine. There's only two. To the godly walker, to the godly doer, there's eternal life. But to this person who he's talking about, rightly will get wrath, fury. And wrath, wrath when? At the second coming of Christ Jesus. Do you know this idea for wrath is the word in Greek, orge, which you can clearly guess what Anglicized, anglicized word we get, orgy. The word orgy that we associate in the modern vernacular is sexual passion. That, that unbridled the release of that with, with fervor and vigor. Well, what the text is saying about God's orge is against lawlessness, against unrighteousness, God will have that same kind of anger, fury, that will come out boiling hot towards unrighteousness, towards this individual. God will render to that person out of his eternal person in this, and it will not be beneficial. So for the pushback of the godless, this also divides into two paths. The natural path, because this is what you are naturally on, every single one of us. Unless you give your life to Christ Jesus and begin to walk after him and do what he calls you to do, you will be on this path naturally. 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 You don't have to do anything and you're already on this path. This is the natural path. Or if there was a street sign that you lived on, it would say, I live on misery way. Don't laugh. This is a reality. Ephesians 2.3. Ephesians 2.3 tells us much. Can't turn fast enough. Among whom we also lived, once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. This is you, unless you surrender your life to Jesus. This is me, unless I surrender my life to Jesus. Now again, is the way for the godly, does it require perfection? No, but it requires works. Not for salvation, but because of salvation. Not for the root of salvation, but as a consequence but as a consequence of the fruit of salvation. I ask you again, where is the evidence in your life? You have to supply that. And God will render to each of us according to our work. Again, this road is the road we're all on. This is the natural path, the misery way. We're on that road. Well, you must get off this path. I ask you again as we get ready to wrap up. I ask you again, where are you going? Where is your destination? What is your path? Paul is not fighting the doctrine of justification by faith in this text. James is not saying that justification by faith is nullified and that works are required to bring about salvation. No, they both work together. Romans is talking about Abraham when he believed and it was counted to him as righteous. James is talking about when Isaac was offered and that showed forth his justification. They both are pointing to this. In other words, you can't divorce works from the life of the believer. You can't. You can't divorce them. They belong together. You must know for sure, people. And it is not too late to change your path. 
I'll say it this way in, in closing. Today, you are either, everyone listen to me closely. Look at me, every single one of you. All of you are either on a path of crowns or you are on a path of frowns. It's one or the other. Change your path. Let's pray.